Uh, cool. Right. Let's give this a go. So um, my name's Lee, as I said before. Uh, I'm primarily a front of house engineer these days, but I've sort of spent the last uh, seven or so years touring, uh, doing a wide range of things, monitors, systems, uh, general audio technique, attacking for tours, one-offs, venue work, uh, you know, 100 cap clubs up to stadiums over the past sort of six or seven years. Uh, I started originally as a studio guy. Um, and um, I, that's all I ever wanted, really wanted to do uh, for as long as I could remember. And when I, I got a job as a studio engineer and I, and I loved it, but um, I kind of wasn't kind of, I don't know, it was kind of one of those things of like not, not meeting your heroes or whatever. And I got the chance to go out and mix a band that I'd been working with in the studio as an assistant. And that kind of cemented everything. So I ended up packing in my job and living off a credit card for six months because I had no money. Um, uh, and I don't really regret any of it. Um, and, uh, over the past seven or so years, I've managed to meet so many amazing people, a lot of which are in this chat. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. There's not many jobs that you can, that you can say that that's part of it. Um, and you know, one of the coolest things is that those people that started as, uh, acquaintances, friends, whatever, colleagues became friends. Um, but and that's and that's one huge huge element of it but i also am a firm firm believer in peer learning and being able to you know uh converse with people about workflow ideas why do you use that microphone versus that microphone and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. there's there's you know there's a lot that could go into that so um again one of the reasons why i set this whole thing up the ground loop was uh, as a way of kind of being able to aggregate that into something that, you know, we're all spending a lot of time on our phones. So I figured this would be a cool way of being able to share what people are up to um, on the Instagram feed or share links to cool webinars or links or useful things, blah, blah, blah. Uh, cool. So, yeah, I'm Lee. Uh, primarily front of house monitor engineer these days. Uh, currently, the past two or so years, I've worked for this band called Pale Waves from Manchester. Uh, and in between that, I've done a whole heap of artists. Um, I've mixed front of house for Dominic Fike for a while, Love Him Tragedy. Um, and yeah, it's it, primarily the last two years or so, it's been really, really busy with Pale Waves. Um, so the 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 sort of the main thing about this whole conversation is about gear and equipment because I haven't talked shop to anyone for weeks. Uh, so this is going to be really cathartic, hopefully. Um, uh, so yeah, today I'm going to kind of go through a couple of, uh, things with, um, unfortunately I have no access to any of my actual gear. Uh, so what I've done is I've got, um, my offline editor. Um, I've also got my UAD console session, which is, uh, which I'll go into pretty, pretty in-depth detail about. Um, and then I've also got some photos of the rig and I'll be able to talk through kind of stuff like that. Um, so first of all, I'll start with the rig rundown as it will. Um, I am a Digico user. Um, I use a lot of different consoles in lots of different ways, some more than others. But if I have my choice nowadays, it's always going to be a Digico um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, I really like how they sound. And, you know, I, I, I do believe there's a lot to be said for flexibility in any console and that being a, a very attractive reason to own it or use it. But um, I just really like how they sound and they it, it fits with my the way that I've, you know, the way that I work and, you know, what, what comes in and what comes out, it all kind of makes sense. Um, so first of all, I really like how they sound. Um, second of all, they're incredibly flexible. Um, and you'll see why this particular point is one of the reasons why I would choose to use those over pretty much anyone, any other console on the market right now. Um, being able to take a file that you built on an SD11 and scale it up to an SD7 for a fly show or a 10 or a nine or a five or whatever with a very simple conversion process. I know everyone kind of complains about that there's a converter in, in, in the sort of the pathway of doing this, but honestly, I've done it, you know, 
six dozen times or whatever now and i've never had any issues as long as you're clever with you know what version of firmware you're going into and what you're coming out of and you do some very basic like housekeeping with file management and all that kind of stuff then you i think you're golden um just as a pause if anything that i'm saying right now is sparking a question please stick it in the chat because when i go into the screen share I can't see the chat window. So any questions that you can even think of right off the bat or whatever, stick it in the chat. And then whenever I come back to looking at my own mug, I'll go through those. Um, but I will try and dip out of every section to look at the chat to see if there's anything pertinent. Um, you can also unmute your mic. Um, and if you can say who you are or what the question is, and I'll try and answer it while I'm having the conversation, just because I can't see everyone at the same time as being in the screen share. Um, so yeah, flexibility is big, big part of it. Um, the reason why I choose the SD12, or sorry, the SD11, um, one of the biggest reasons is footprint, um, because a band like Pale Waves, they're a kind of like medium level club band, uh, but we've been doing all shapes and sizes, little one-off BBC introducing things, you know, in sheds, in parts of the woods, at Latitude Festival, or tiny clubs in the U S versus like stadiums in the UK supporting bands, uh, or arena runs supporting bands. So I'm pretty conscious of like trying to keep my footprint small so that I can get in and out really quickly. And I'm not going to annoy anyone. I really want to make everyone's day as easy as possible, including my own. So, um, and, uh, that affords me, you know, it's the little shopping till as everyone jokes, you know, that affords me all the flexibility that I, I kind of need. Uh, so I've stuck with it for two years now. Um, and I've, as you'll see very shortly, I've run out of everything. It's completely full. And I'm having to do some really crazy workarounds to do some certain things, but that's kind of part of the fun. Um, do I own, run my own fiber for the big sports shows? No. Um, for festivals um, and anything support wise, um, we have just ended up specking our own fiber um and paying for it and basically whoever the headliners vendor is they will provide it for us um and uh, it's kind of the only way of doing it i've tried running shows on maddie and cat5 maddie and it's it's just not robust robust enough um as far as i'm concerned um i think really the only way if you're going to use an sd series console for front of house is to run it on on optics um sd11i prayer uh, so I should have specified about that. Uh, SD11i Stealth Core 2. Um, I'm not running the very, very new version. I'm running at 1090, I believe. Um, and that's just for a legacy reason, being able to jump um, backwards and forwards um, with uh, the, the rig that I had. Um, I didn't want to go up. I try and actually stay like one behind unless there's a real reason to, to do so. Um, so yeah, so this is probably a good point. I'll just jump straight in. So I'm gonna just uh, do I own one? No, I don't. Uh, the audio audio vendor for um, for Pale Waves is ASB Sound. Uh, we get everything out of their London shop, and they've been absolutely awesome uh, in terms of worldwide support for us for the last two years. Um, and they've been able to source stuff for us at festivals and kind of anywhere um the the fact that you know we can finish a uk tour in london on on a thursday and then play a show in austin on saturday and basically they'll clone the rig that we had uh in either their la or their cleveland shop and freight it over to the venue and it's pretty much turnkey um but i'm pretty meticulous about how how i design and build the rigs uh, I also designed the monitor rigs for our previous monitor engineer who's now left working for the band. So we're currently in the interim period with no monitor engineer, but hey, we've got no gigs, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but I am I take a lead on sort of the whole infrastructure and that's something that's kind of made this whole thing super efficient. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully this works. Cool. Can everyone see my Digico screen? Can you give me a thumbs up. Awesome. All right, cool. Oh, I got one more person. Oh, 
something in the chat. Oh, I can see the chat. Great. Full channel list. Yes, I am going to. Uh, I am going to do that. Um, sure. Okay. So before I go into anything else, um, what I do want to do is. Cool. Can everyone see a picture on a screen? Yeah, cool. Sorry, I'm gonna have to keep doing this. I feel like a total pensioner. I got my I got my phone hacked the other day and I'm like everything I do, I'm just like, oh, just making sure. Cool. So um this is my rig. Um unfortunately I don't have the real thing here, but this is as good as I can get. So as I said, uh SD eleven I uh with Two screens. Anyone that gets that, you know, you'll 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 get the joke. Um, I used to have a lot more screens in my rig, and I kind of downsized at the start of this year. Um, so I've got one overview, um, and then I have one uh, screen here, which is kind of a aggregate of everything that's in this rig. So I run two Mac Minis uh, here. Um, and a and a KVM switch, uh, and there's a keyboard and mouse up there. So within this screen, um, I run Smart on one computer, and I run UAD Console on the other computer. Uh, sorry, uh, Smart and Console on one computer, and then on the other computer, which you'll see here, I actually use screen sharing to to tap to tap into, uh, is where I run uh, my virtual soundcheck slash record computer. And I also run uh, walk-in music playback and all that kind of stuff uh, from that same computer. Um, so being able to screen share on a network is really interesting because um, I don't necessarily always have to have this up here. I normally sort of minimize this window as small as I can and just have the big counter running. And it means that I know that my recording for the show is still running. Uh, but I don't need to stare at waveforms for, you know, however long. Um, and it means that I get some screen real estate back. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I used to have two screens for those two things. And then I got rid of that, you know, went to KBM. Um, I run a stream deck um, running macro stream, uh, of which I will send uh, I'll add a link to this uh, later on. This is kind of one of the most important things in my rig now. And it's basically this very smart uh, bunch of people in in Norway, I believe, that have uh, basically coded a an app that runs on a headless Raspberry Pi, um, and it basically uh, uses the OSC portion of the Digico's iPad app and enables you to assign OSC buttons to each of uh, the buttons on the Stream Deck, and you build that and populate that using macros uh, like you would uh, on any other console. Um, the Digico only ha the SD11 only has eight buttons up here with no way of labeling them. And I've got relatively fat fingers. So I figured that I uh, would try and come up with a way of making that super foolproof so that I wouldn't screw up. Uh, but also the fact that you can color code things so you can see something has an action on or an action off is way handier. Um, if you can have two very different colors, for example, instead of it being off and just green, I don't know if that it's on or off or whatever. Um, so that's that's super cool. I'll try and go into a bit more detail about that later on. Um, apart from that, uh, I'll, I've got a little uh, this amazing little uh, shout speaker that I found from a company called Galaxy Audio that make this tiny little um, shout speaker that is hilariously loud and it sounds terrible, but it's perfect for, for talkbacks. Um, and um, it fits in a 1510. It, it has a little DC brick, so I can actually tie it in to the power strip in the dog box at the back of this console, and it takes up no room at all, and I just have it mounted on an LP claw. Uh, pair of headphones, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, then I have this outboard rack. Now, um, a lot of this stuff will be pretty obvious to a lot of people, uh, maybe not, so I'll kind of run through it pretty briefly. Uh, as I said, I got two Mac Minis. 
uh, one running UAD um, and smart. And then I got one running the record. Uh, they are ver they are the same computer in terms of spec, um, same CPU, RAM, whatever. And they're 2012 Mac minis. Uh, I have four of them. I've got two in this rig and I've got two at home. They're for the money uh, are phenomenal. Um, I'm just looking at this chat. Um, yeah, they're phenomenal for the money. Uh, super stable. Um, you know, really small form factor. Uh, gets rid of laptops. It means that there's less uh, keyboards to get drinks spilt on or thrown out or whatever. And it it powers up super quick. Uh, and yeah, it's just it's streamlined everything uh, to to no end. So. Um, that's been a big, big factor. Uh, as I said, a small KVM switch. Uh, that's just two uh, two outputs. Uh, and I've got a, a Kensington trackball and a um, keyboard up here. Um, I've got a Scarlett 2i2, which is doing all my smart IO. Um, and that uh, I will explain a bit more about because it actually doesn't use the analog IO in the traditional way. It actually goes through my converter, which is at the bottom of my rack. Um, the next three uh, rack units are my vocal chain. So I have an analog vocal chain um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I have a I have a very uh, sensitive singer. Um, uh, in terms of her dynamic range, her mic technique. Um, throughout the show, she's got some songs where she can belt, and then there's some parts where she is, it's barely a whisper. Um, and I've, you know, it, a lot of it's trying to make sure that that vocal is, is as, as sort of far forward as possible. Um, Pale Waves are kind of like gothy indie pop band. Uh, so there's like ma loads of 80s influences like um, The Cure, uh, Cranberries, um, bands like that. Uh, but they have a, a fair, a, like a very modern sort of twist to it. So they use a lot of like drum samples. There's loads of low end information and a lot of twinkly stuff in the playback and stuff like that from keyboards and synths. So um, trying to get Heather's vocal to, to sit in the middle is is kind of my priority so i i before i had this stuff i originally ran it in through console and did a kind of a similar thing but um honestly the d2 or a 901 i used to have a 901 and it died so i had to swap it out for a d2 uh into the distressor kind of saves my gig um and the, and the really nice thing about the distressor hardware is that you can ride the input and the output at the same time throughout the gig and that's what i i probably spend 50 60 percent of my gig just doing that to try and balance out the amount of compression uh versus the actual gain of the vocal um that runs into a little 500 series chassis i have a one u um which has uh, a midas eq uh which is a pretty cheap little box um i wanted a little grab eq just in there's a, you know our show starts and the vocal just co comes in and if it's too bright or too dull or there's a weird honk in the mid-range i really don't have enough time to be able to page into something and do that and do that so within those first sort of five ten seconds of the, sh of the set i'm just hovering on those points and i set the eq points to those places that i i know i'm going to use uh and then i'll either duck or add and then it's like once it's done generally it's okay um the EQ is actually after, so the chain is as you see it, it goes uh, dynamic EQ, distressor, compressor, then into the, the parametric EQ. And then this final box is the Rubric Me 545. It's a single channel uh, uh, 500 series version of their two channel, one new uh, primary source and answer. Um, which I run on the back end of the vocal. And it's basically, if anyone that's not familiar with it, it's like a super intelligent gate sort of uh, ducker kind of thing. Um, and the the way that the filter detection circuit and whatever in it works, it seems to work super well for vocals. Um, and it cuts my sort of overall stage volume down by 
uh, coming down her vocal when she's not on it by anything from six to nine dB. Um, so whenever we get into super small clubs, uh, being able to, having that, you know, um, at my disposal is super useful because it basically it 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 saves my gig in a lot of ways. Uh, it helps with game before feedback, but that's not really the primary reason why I use it. The main reason I use it is to try and get cymbal hash snare drums out of her vocal um um and i also do another thing but i'll come back to that uh next thing is a new piece to me is this the ssl fusion i got this for the tour we just did um and i've been experimenting with this on my band bus um just as a sort of overall bus processor um and it's great it's a it's a fantastic bit of kit for the money it does a lot um all the sections individually are useful on their own, but in combination, sort of, it's like, it's, you know, uh, salt and pepper to taste. Um, I don't know who that was, that might've been me, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've now actually just got that on my whole mix bus, uh, and it's doing a little bit of everything, and it's really, really good. Uh, so if you ever get the chance to check one out, I would. Um, then it goes in on the next kind of bits in the rack are, uh, I've got two Apollos. I've got a, an Apollo 16 Mark II and an Apollo 8P Mark II, uh, which are audio interfaces like, uh, like any sort of standard audio interface. But, uh, the main sort of brain behind this whole rig is that I run everything, um, in, uh, in an out of console. Um, the main question everyone has ever has asked is going, well, why don't you use the UAD live rack unit? And the simple answer is, is that the, it, it, the live rack in its current iteration didn't actually exist when I first bought into this sort of thing. And out of stubbornness, I was like, well, I've got this already, so I'm going to use it. Um, but there's also some other little things that I actually prefer about using it this way that you can't do on the live rack. Um, so I might I might upgrade at some point, but at the minute um, I already had these units. They were in my studio, and I've just moved them into the live domain, and it's made total sense. So I'm I'm not gonna diverge too far from that for now. Um, and then the final bit, which is arguably the most important bit, apart from the drawers, you know, they're pretty useful. Um, are the fer is the Ferrofish A32, which is my MADI converter. So um, for to answer your question, this is the answer to your question. Um, everything in this rack that has an input and an output goes in and out of this Ferrofish A32. So when I first started with this band, the budget really only could stretch to an SD11, and I had one of these Apollo 16s and some D-subbed XLR looms. Uh, but plugging in, you know, 12 XLRs on the back of my console and eight outputs every day was soul destroying, and I screwed it up every single day. I just got super bored of it, and uh, I was like, "There's definitely a better way of utilizing this." So um, I got turned on to this company, and it's phenomenal. Um, so my whole rig can par up with a single 16 amp in the back and two MADI cables going between the Ferrofish and my console, and everything that's in the rack. That's it, um, and it's super, super simple. Um, one second. I think somebody might be trying to get in. Um, there we go. Sorry, folks. Cool. Are you back on the photo? That makes sense. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, Chris, can you want to send me a vocal docker? Yeah, Neve545 is the primary source enhancer. Um, all right, boy. Yes, Harley. Yeah, that's basically how it works. So all the Apollo inputs and outputs, uh, the distressor, uh, sorry, the, vo the analog vocal chain, uh, the two bus, everything basically gets tied into um, the Ferrofish. Um, I have a kind of version of the, uh, let's see if I have it here. Do, do, do.
So yeah, I kind of, um, I don't know how high of a resolution this is on anyone's screen, but it, this is kind of an overview of, I kind of make a little spreadsheet. Uh, so the first 16 inputs and outputs are the first Apollo 16. Uh, the second, uh, so 17 through 24 are the Apollo 8P. 25 through 32 are mix bus. And then this kind of thing at the end was just kind of like, well, I have a load of channels that I'm not using. So it, surely there's a way I can make this simpler. So, um, my smart outputs, um, for example, inputs and outputs, apart from the physical mic signal that's on top of it, um, the inputs and outputs get rooted through the Ferrofish. So on my console, I can dynamically choose what, what the uh, reference input is to my smart. So whether it's going to be pink noise looping back through itself for transfer, or I can change it to be a matrix output for, uh, or, or QBUS or solo output um for uh for smart so i can do transfer functions during the show or in tuning um i'll kind of show that whenever i whenever i get back onto that so uh that's that's pretty much the rig uh and this is what it did look like the last time i was trying to build it uh which was an absolute mess um there's a lot of cable in this thing uh Big shout out to my friend uh, Dan Richards at Eighth Day Sound, who slaved over this with me for a day and a half, uh, and put up with all of my obsessive compulsive nonsense. Um, and uh, it worked first time, so there we go. Uh, cool. So let me just jump straight into the console then. Um, so there's nothing. There's nothing crazy. I'm not reinventing the wheel really with anything. Um, but this band have their own sort of set of challenges in terms of um, spectrum um, and, you know, trying to get things to sound like the record. Uh, and they've given me a lot of license. So um, I just decided to just go all guns blazing and try and faithfully, rep, you know, represent what the intention of the record was, et cetera, et cetera. And put some of my, of my own spin on some things. So, um, everyone see the Digico screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so it's a 96K show file. Um, as you can see here, I got nothing left. It's completely maxed out. Um, and everyone kind of laughs and says like, oh, well, you've made it probably more overcomplicated than it needs to be. There is an element of that. Um, but anything I've done in here is, is genuinely for good reason. And it's not me just like having the crack. Um, there's a little bit of an element to that. You know, I could, I, I mean, I have a version of this show file, which is none of my outboard. It's just totally everything in the box. Um, and one of the questions that I do get asked is, is that what is, what's my plan B? Um, with, with wave servers, et cetera, et cetera, you can build in elements of redundancy. Um, but what I've kind of done with this is utilizing macros. Um, I have a panic macro, which I'll show when I go into my macros, but I have a panic macro that basically bypasses uh, all of my UAD processing. Um, and I, whenever I set this show file up and anytime I ever make any changes to it that are sort of dramatic, I will spend most of the time with either a live band and sound check or, or virtual sound check, A being between my panic macro and all my processing in and trying to figure out where the pitfalls are if I was to lose everything. One of the benefits of the UAD console, uh, is, is that if you, um, if you basically turn the computer off or pull the thunderbolts out, all the audio will still pass within the box. So they kind of run the headless. Uh, whereas with the, um, with the wave stuff, there's some pitfalls within that. Um, and I didn't really want to go down that route. So, uh, yeah. So that's one, this is a small little, uh, note to make. Um, yeah. So it's a full, it's an absolutely full show file. Um, I'll do a quick little thing on like how I have the console laid out. Um, 
I so I have one fader bank. I've got twelve faders. Um, I've got mm, forty. Mm, I've got forty-eight lines from stage now. Um, used to be thirty-two, and then whenever I started working for them, it became forty-eight. <laughs> so um, I have don't have a lot of sort of real estate when it comes to faders. So I had to kind of do some bits and pieces and be. Uh, kind of identify where the priorities would be in terms of how I laid the console out. So um, in the style of Pooch, who I don't know if any would you, some of you will probably know, he's just done a very similar thing to this where he's kind of gone through his whole console layout. Um, so I'm going to try and pay somewhat some homage to him, although he's infinitely more qualified at doing this than I am. Um, but I'll try and be brief and try and uh, not, not make this... Uh, any more painful than it needs to be. Uh, not used to doing stuff like this, but you know, uh, here we go. So um, I, the one thing I do, so I've got three layers. Um, my top uh, bank is always my VCA. So regardless of which layer I'm on, I've always got access to the VCAs. And that's just because in the heat of the battle, if there's a move or something kind of goes wrong or I need to really action something pretty quickly, if I'm buried in my layer three media, you know, having a listen to my front of house ambient, and then I just hear an issue, I'm like, bam, and I'm straight back. Um, and when I'm on bigger consoles uh, on the SD range, I will do the same thing. So my VCAs are always my top layer on that center bank. Uh, or if I don't have a center bank, it will always be on my output side bank. So regardless of where I am, I always have access to VCAs. Um, the whole gig, um, in terms of all the key inputs actually live on three fader layers. So I've got drums, um, which are pretty standard sort of inputs, kick in, kick out, snare, snare, hats, three, two rack toms, one floor tom, um, symbols, SBDS, and then these are effects. Um, I utilize kind of a, a couple of multi-channels, which are very specific to Digico platform, um, which enables me to, again, consolidate my fader real estate um, um, and also be able to consistently turn up the same thing relative with one fader uh, without having to use out groups or, or whatever. At one point, my whole drum kit was in multi-groups. Multi um, I was actually able to fit the whole band in one 12 fader layer, um, which which worked great for a while. Um, but uh, I I wasn't really into it because there was a couple of points where I had to like dive in and, and try and um, get at things. So I split it all out again. So all the things that I don't really need to get at like all the time, I I, I put in multi groups. So um, I can unfold those and I've got access to my individual channels. Um, same with the SBDS. So the idea there is that I have some relative fader gain shading there. And it means that if the SBDS as a whole is too quiet or too loud, I don't have to like get in there and try and, you know, turn, um, you know, gauge three faders. Normally if one element of it is too quiet, the whole thing's too quiet. So I just use on a multi-channel. Um, one thing I try to do is um, because you can put any any fader anywhere on the console. I I try to spend as much time looking forward at the gig um, without trying to be buried in faders. Now I've been touring with this sort of show file for two years, and it's kind of morphed over time. But one thing I do try to do because I mix inputs from all different sorts of sources on all of all these layers because of the fact that I don't have a lot of faders. I try and make things like my stage channels and my effect returns very clearly different. Um, so normally anything that's an effect or in a return, I write in capital letters. So I have gate and fizz, um, but you'll see like all of my, uh, well, the SBDS doesn't count before anyone decides to get, you know, picky there. Uh, but I will, um, I will, tend to do everything else as uh, just normal uh, uppercase and then uh, lowercase for everything else. Um, 
do, do, do. Yeah, so git is a gated reverb that I use on the snare drum. I'll come back and sort of talk about the effects a bit more. But one thing I do here is the fizz channel, um, which is purely um, a studio trick that I used to use. Um, the input for this is a white noise generator. And as you can see, I've got it like it's pretty heavily filtered. Um, and that is a white noise generator that is um, keyed um, from my. Uh, so the, it's basically it's gated and the, the key input for that is a snare trigger. So whenever she plays the snare drum, the noise the, the noise gate opens and then the white noise plays and I kind of tune the, the attack and the hold and release to make it kind of sound like uh, a sample, like a like an 808 kind of fizzy snare. Um, it enables me to get like top end definition from like, she doesn't play a lot of like, um, Kira the drummer doesn't play a lot of um, very articulate kind of like ghost notey kind of things. So this works really well. So it just it's nice for some parts to be able to just make this really nice kind of like synthesized top end in the snare drum. So I started doing that really early on and she really likes it. Um, so that's what fizz is because a couple of people have asked me about that before. Um, one second. Let's try to see, I keep losing the chat window. So I'd like to try and answer these questions as they go along. Okay, cool. I'm back. All right. Um, next layer is the band. So that's pretty much everything else in the on on the stage is there. Um, as I said before, I use multi groups for a couple of things. Uh, so I've got one for bass. I get two channels of bass from stage. One is a clean and one is a dirty. Uh, they never play at the same time. And this is something that I had tried to like champion for a while. I've never really been a big fan of pre post mic effect mic you know you get you end up getting like six bass lines um and even if you've got two di's even if they're a different slightly different di one's like a j48 and one's a sans amp i've never had any luck with uh phase coherency um so what i kind of wanted to do is try and keep this really simple and i was like this guy only has two sounds, you know, he's got clean and he's got dirty. So I was like, okay, well then why don't we just make this? So when you play the clean stuff, it comes down one channel. When you play the dirty stuff, it comes down the other channel. And it means that you can really fine tune the response for both his ears as much as my front of house. Um, so that was a, that was a big revelation. seems really simple, but it actually made a huge difference. Um, guitars, kind of a similar thing. Um, we have in this instance, I've only actually got two lines coming from stage. Um, I've got a 57 on a, on an external cabinet and I've got a DI, um, which runs off the amp. Um, I don't actually use the, the mics at all anymore. Uh, I've just gone straight Palmer PDI 09 DI. Um, and they're a bit of a love hate thing. Um, not everyone likes them. Um, I think a lot of people judge them on what they sound like by themselves. Um, but as something I've had drilled into me since I started doing this is that you shouldn't listen to anything by itself. Um, and for the context of this band, the DIs uh, just work really well they provide loads of articulation in the top end uh, the mid-range because there's a lot of stuff going on um and it's also really nice to be able to boost low end on guitars without worrying about something feeding back or taking off or actually getting muff like you know like you know muddy and whatever so um so i have two di's um Sorry, so I have a DI on, on, on each guitar player, but so uh, HS is Hugo, who's kind of, he's kind of the main guitar player. He plays the whole set. Um, so um, I wanted to try and come up with a way of creating something that was wide and interesting sounding, but not like hard panned, um, 
you know, and weird in, in the bigger rooms. So one of the things I've actually been doing now is I have the same DI double patched um, with the same EQ. Um, but all I really do is delay one side by, in this instance, 11 milliseconds. And it just works. Um, and it, you know, it, it's one of those things where if you're if you're if you're right on center, when you combine that with the effect sends um, and returns that I have for the guitars, you get guitar all everywhere. And then if you go off to either one side, you still got the same guitar. So you're you're kind of cheating that that issue that you have with hard panning stuff. Um, it creates a kind of a pseudo stereo. Um, and again, this is not, I've stolen this from somebody else. Like this is not my idea, but it works. Um, and it means that whenever Heather, who's the lead singer plays guitar, she is right bang in the middle. So it's that thing of whenever she plays guitar for a song, you really notice it because you've kind of got used to the fact that the guitar has been here the whole time. And then whenever the Heather plays, it's there and it keeps keeps Hugo's guitar out of that center image for the vocal because the vocal is super important. So that's what Hugo gets. Uh, and Heather, uh, same thing. She has a 57 on her cab and a DI, but as I said, I only use the DI. Um, I also use on hers a load of DigiTube, um, which looks really extreme, but it makes a huge difference for some reason. Um, I use bits and pieces of this DigiTube thing. I wasn't wholly convinced about it at the first, but um, when you use it selectively, it can do some really cool stuff. So I have a little bit of DigiTube on that. Um, spare guitar is pretty self-explanatory. We have an acoustic, which we use at some points during the, um, during the tour. Doesn't get used very often. Uh, one thing I would point out here is that I use a lot of dynamic bands instead of static. Um, for the one song she plays acoustic on, sorry, I'm just going to try and get this. So you can actually see this. Um, these are all floating. So they, those aren't static cuts. Uh, she plays a lot of finger picky kind of guitar. Um, and I had, I kind of didn't like the fact that whenever she played each chord, if you were trying to notch out feedback, whenever she went changed to the same, to a different chord that wasn't an issue, it kind of lacked something. So I started to really experiment with the dynamic bands on the on the Digico, and that's really cool. So it means that whenever she is playing that range, it ducks, and then whichever she goes up a little bit higher, that kind of comes back again, and it it seems to kind of even out the response with, uh, and also kind of taking care of the feedback issue. Um, so that's that. Um, the, then I've got a blank space and then I got synths, sounds, BVs, sub. Uh, these are just straight up playback tracks. Um, the BV is literally mostly backing vocal effects. It's not, even, it's not necessarily a dry vocal. There's just a load of stuff on there. Um, that I, I couldn't reproduce live without he like hideous game before feedback issues and, and stuff like that. So I just decided to do everything, uh, the way that we mixed it was, is that all the BV stems are very wet and it's just, a, it's a, it's a small thing to put in there. It's not to rely on it. Um, sub is all the subby stuff. Um, and I kind of did that for a couple of reasons. One of the, one of the reasons why is because I have the, uh, this, it's compressed, but it's actually triggered by the bass group. So, um, whenever Charlie plays harder, the bassist, uh, it kind of does a little bit of a ducking on that sub feed. So it means that this, the bass, uh, coming out of playback never really overtakes what he's doing. Um, I've got some keys lines, which we haven't used for a while. Uh, and then I got vocal stuff here. Um, HBG, Heather, Brian Gracie, um, the boss. So I've got her vocal. Um, I've got this radio vox, which I also call Gaga in a couple of places. This is just this very crazy filtered and, uh, 
very overdriven vocal that I do. And I kind of just do it for kind of spots during the show to just kind of create a bit of an interesting vocal effect. Uh, it kind of sounds like a bit like a megaphone. Um, and I just utilize EQ and effect send and filters. I'm not using a plugin to do it, which has kind of been cool, which means I've been able to replicate it on loads of consoles. Um, AT is, uh, so there's no auto tune in our show. Um, but on this last run, what I've been experimenting with is, um, Heather has wanted to hear certain songs with at certain parts with auto tune. Um, so what I do is I basically just use, use this as a return channel. Um, I basically run a version of Autotune in uh, UAD console. Um, and it just means that if she wants to listen to it on a virtual sound check basis and headphones, she can. That's the only reason why it's there. But I also print it every night as well so that she's got a version in the multi-track that she can listen to. Um, and it's hilariously T-pained. It's, it's, it's very, very much for an effect. It's not actually being used for her correction. Um, so uh that's what the AT channel is. And then I've and then I'm into effects. Uh I love effects. I'm a definitely a very effect heavy mixer. Um this band, as I said, have a load of influences, so I was just trying to uh make it sort of interesting. Uh so by trying to just, you know, change up do big macro changes on effects from song to song and stuff like that. So um so nonlin the gate reverb as i said before uh big snare which is an effect that i throw in every now and then which is just a big cathedral kind of snare drum pitch which is a up and down kind of thickener using uh the built-in digico uh chorus box verb doubler ping pong uh, I have a ping pong delay, which I actually use a 10 tap delay from Digico inbuilt. Um, but one of the reasons why I have it on uh, a multi channel is you can see it's really, really filtered. Um, but I also delay it further. And that's the reason why it's on a multi instead of a stereo. So the left and the right return of that delay are delayed differently. Um, these started off as kind of arbitrary numbers, but um, it just helped push it out further for those little bits when you threw it into the delay. Um, and because uh, it was kind of a something I only added recently because I, I wasn't getting enough sort of that kind of classic, mm -hmm. you know. So that's what I did and it kind of worked. Um, um, and then I have an echo which used to be an outboard RE20 uh, Space Echo, which I have here. This is my modified one, um, which I added an external tap tempo to. Um, but I wanted to try and carry less gear, so I use a plug-in now. Um, uh, hands up, who's bored? Uh, no? Okay, great. Everyone, nobody's gone to sleep. Great. I love it. Um, second layer, BCA, as I said. Uh, so everything input-wise kind of falls into logical groups. This is kind of where I do most of the heavy lifting on uh, processing-wise. Um, so everything goes into a group that logically would go into a group. Um, and then on the insert, this is where my UAD console stuff comes into effect. Um, I do a mono vocal, which is all of her, all of Heather's mono vocal channels, and then that goes into a, a stereo group, um, which is combined with all of her vocal effects and the BV stem. Uh, the reason why I have I use an extensive amount of groups is in my recording. I record all the stage inputs as normal, but I also record all of my group outputs as individual sort of stems. And it means that with that, I can throw together a broadcast ready mix for YouTube or, or whoever super quickly. And I can do it with all of the kind of heavy lifting already done uh, instead of having to 
pull everything into a Pro Tools session, re and whatever. Um, and it translates pretty well. So, um, and yeah, being able to give somebody some stems of something to do something with is, is kind of handy. So, um, so, and then, uh, yeah, I have a band mix. So I have a band group and all that stuff goes into the band. Uh, and then these two basically go to the master and then we have a gig. Um, I've got eight oxes, which are pretty sensible kind of things. Um, the vocal send, uh, so I don't have enough auxes on this console to do what I want to do. So I basically just double patch or triple patch or quadruple patch my aux outputs into my Farofish to feed multiple inputs on my console. Um, so that's kind of a workaround. There's a lot of little workarounds in this whole thing to get it, but it, it all kind of, you know, there's not very much that this console has actually spat, you know, turned around and said, no, you can't do that. Even though it's the baby in the, in the range. So, uh, matrix kind of standard left, right sub. Uh, sometimes I run it as a fill. Um, but nine times out of 10, if I'm touring, I will run left and right AES into an LM44 in front of house. And that will do my left, right sub fill, uh, distribution for the PA. Uh, do, 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 Francois. Yes, I'm going to come back to the foot switch. Uh, is your virtual setup all over sound grid? Oh, yes. Good point, Burr. I never brought that up. Sorry. So, um, the Digico that I use has a waves card in it, uh, which for all intents and purposes is basically just an MGB. So, um, I do 64 ins and outs every day on a single cat five cable. Uh, the console already had it. So instead of having to add an MGB, which in my situation, I couldn't because I don't have enough MADI ports uh, or have to convert to cat five MADI and all that kind of nonsense. I was like, well, why don't I just do this? Cause it's super simple. So yeah, I run sound grid for recording and virtual playback. It's a bit buggy at times. Uh, I have to do this kind of got this weird ritual now where I, um, run my, uh, sound check, uh, and record 10 minutes or whatever of my sound check. I stop the recording. I turn, I mute the PA matrix and then I go into virtual and listen to my playback. And if there's any glitches or pops, all I really do is reseat the cat five on both ends, do the same thing again. And nine times out of 10, that solves it. So that's the only kind of weird workaround. And nobody's ever really been able to work out why it does that, but it, it does. So that's just part of my day. Keeps it interesting. Uh, uh, so yeah, I have a smart output, as I said earlier on. N most of the time, this is just a, a, a mono sum of my left and right, um, which goes into my smart rig for a reference input. Uh, I do an LX mix here and stereo. so. Um, this is basically my two track mix, um, with some small tweaks, uh, plus a click. And then the whole thing gets delayed back to the position of the LD, which uh, the last show was 124 milliseconds from the PA. Um, and then I have a two track, which is just basically my left and right, um, but just with a gain control. So. Um, just one notice, one, one thing to note on that. Um, the LX mix basically takes my, my master, uh, click talkbacks and then also a load more drums than I actually have in my front of house mix. And I don't know why, but that's, that's what he wanted and that's what he needs. So. It's kind of painful to listen to, uh, but it's what he needs to do his show. So, um, how are we all doing? We all good? Cool. Uh, I can't believe I'm doing this for one hour already. Jesus. I'll try and speed this up a little bit, but, um, last layer, uh, is triggers. So I use gate, uh, I use triggers on all my drums to key my gates, um, which I've, 
borrowed, stolen from loads of my favorite people that do this job. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that one of the main reasons why I utilize um, triggers is because this drum kit is super tight. Everything is super, super close together. Uh, like the symbols are less than six inches away from the toms uh, everywhere. Um, and everything's super low and super compact. So, you know, to get to get the drums to sound the way they, they need to, I kind of had to go down this route. So um, every, every drum has uh, a trigger, kick, snare, rack, rack, and floor. Uh, what triggers do I use? I use the Roland RT series. Uh, I used to use the D drum ones years ago, but they always fell apart. Um, I don't know why. They're just not very roadworthy. Um, and, uh, I've got, I've had this set now for years and they've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows and they've been taken on and off every single day. Uh, so yeah, they're great. Um, and the, they, uh, as a drummer also, this is a really weird thing, but, um, the dampening factor that they add to a drum is actually really useful. I find, um, which means that any time I've ever used them with a band uh, or a drummer, um, they've ended up putting like one little bit less moon gel on each drum or tuning it slightly differently. And it's actually, it makes a huge difference if you take the trigger off the actual head. I don't think many people actually really think about that, but it's something I've noticed and it, 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 it sort of paid off. It's a small benefit, side benefit. Um, and then I have a load of talkbacks. Um, I've got two sort of stage left, stage right talkback. Uh, I've got a tech talkback. Um, I've got a drummer talkback, and I've got a monitor talkback. I've got a talkback, and the LD's got a talkback. And the idea is just so that we can all communicate at any point because there is nothing more frustrating than if there's an issue not being able to convey that with anyone. And uh, you know, we don't. I have a shout box, but I only really have that shout box so that I can hear what the band are talking about during the show if there's an, an issue or they're skipping a song or whatever. But everyone else is on ears, so it, uh, communication is critical. And um, I, I think that's that's a big part of what we do now is, is that in these shows, they've become, even if it's a relatively uncomplicated show, everyone needs to be able to talk to each other. So everyone's got to talk back. And then I got media. So I've got two sets of ambient mics. I've got the front of house ambient, which is a stereo pair that I put in front of house for my own uh, record. It actually doesn't point at front of house. It actually points that way. Uh, and that's just to provide an extra delay point um, uh, of ambience. So the cool thing is, is that I uh, know what the time delay to front of house is because the front of house ambient and my smart mic share the same stereo bar so my reference to my uh if i want to delay the the ambience back to front of house i always know what it is without having to screw around so um and then i have the, the stage ambience which are used for the iems um the spare vocal mic is in here the reason why it's in here is because i actually run the spare on a macro so uh it's there and it's in the control group but i don't actually use it as a channel to to in the event that i need to use the spare it's i just it's on a it's on a alt input macro um uh support left right if i've got a support band uh pink noise generator smart and then computer which is just walk-in music uh and that's pretty much it that's that's my really overly complicated 48 input band um there's a whole heap of other things within this, but this would literally take like three hours to go through. So I'm trying to make this pretty brief. Uh, if anyone has any specific questions, please let me know and I'm, I will happily talk about it. Um, but I, you know, it, it's gonna be kind of a bit dry. So, um, so I'll go back to the groups. Uh, Cause as I said, this is kind of where everything kind of, this is where it all kind of makes sense. Um, all my inserts for my, for my UAD are on insert B, which means that they are post everything here. And that's kind of for good reason. Um, I wanted this stuff to carry across, even if I took 
the UAD out of the equation. Uh, so that so they've always existed here. Um, and the whole idea behind the UAD was I wanted to treat my whole uh, plug-in outboard thing as like I had a small rack of outboard. It's like, what if I had like this much money? Um, you know, what what could I? Um, what would I prioritize? You know, say I only have X amount of space in a rack for analog. You know, I, I you know, with the problem with SoundGrid is is that you can put nineteen plugins on every single insert inserted on every single channel. Um, and because I have that studio background, and you know, I used to get frustrated whenever I used to run out of insert slots on Pro Tools. And then generally, if you've used up all those insert slots, you've got a problem. So uh, I, I tried to rethink this whole thing. So nothing at the beginning of this, nothing that I do in UAD was supposed to be mission critical. But slowly but surely, I've realized that um, it has become a big part of how this band sounds live now. And I couldn't do it with waves. So the UAD route made a lot more sense. Um, uh, L. Oh yeah, hi L. You asked me this earlier on. That's right. Um, so the plugin outboard to use reviews, manufacturers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, this is quite quite relevant. Um, uh, I, you know, I've done loads of profile shows. Um, extensively used waves for years in the studio and live, and I, I don't know. I just kind of wanted a bit of a change, so I kind of asked around, and I'd so I'd seen people uh, people like Chris Raybal going to UAD, uh, Andy Mayer, who I'm a big fan of. He was utilizing Apollos um, to do this, uh, but actually the biggest influence for me to to take this route was Michael Connor, coach who mixes uh, Paul Simon's uh, Stevie Dan. Um, he he was the guy that I was like, oh, wow, he's running a load of Mac Minis and a load of Apollos, and he's mixing Steely Dan. He must know what he's doing. So I just sent him a met random message out of the blue uh, on on Facebook, and he got back to me within about 20 minutes and was like, hey, cool. Yeah, this is what I do. This is why I do it. Uh, and he just went at, like to town. He told, told me everything he was doing, and it kind of gave me a lot of confidence to try it at a small level and sort of soak test it and see if it worked. Um, so, yeah, the that that was uh, the specific decision to go to UAD was born out of half interest, half curiosity, and the other half no uh, curiosity into something new that was out of my comfort zone and not in my workflow before, but also um, I was kind of enthused by somebody's creativity um, to utilize something that is not designed to be used as a live front of house effects host. And this is the whole thing because they have a live version. It's called the UAD Live Rack. The main reason why I use and continue to use console is because there's some things you can do within that that really get you a lot more bang for buck. Um, they're not supported ways, I should probably mention, but they, you know, it, I've done hundreds and hundreds of shows and I'm going to touch anything that's wooden in this room, but I have not had a single issue. Um, I, I have a backup for backups, but uh, it, it's, it just works. So um, basically what I do is uh, I consolidate my whole mix down to the, the things that you can see in front of you. There are no channels that have inserts. That's one very important distinction. Um, there's, no, there's nothing, uh, nothing in the show that um, has a console or whatever uh, effect or or plugin inserted on the channel it's only on the groups and the effect returns so all the primary sort of inputs are, are taken care of just on their own um so i'm going to go to console if it'll let me here we go so 
this is my console session. Um, I don't have my l most up to date version um, because it's on my rig and it's locked down in London. But um, this is kind of me building it to the best of my recollection from the last time I left it. Um, so one of the things that is kind of a limitation about the the UAD console and Apollo workflow is is that you are limited to the amount of inputs and outputs point to point that you can get with each unit. So one of the things that Coach taught me was that you can utilize. Uh, actually, uh, before I go any further, is everyone kind of familiar with how UAD console works or even what the software is like? Yeses or nos? I mean, or or maybe's? Okay, so. Console is essentially a standalone mixer that exists on the Apollo. Um, and it is, you know, they say it's zero latency. It's pretty low latency. Um, they were designed so that you could do all of your fold back for studios and recordings and whatever through console while you're recording into your DAW of choice. Um, or what you can do, which is really cool, is, is that you can bring your inputs into console, put a lot of inserts and process things the way you like it, and actually commit those as they go into your DAW of choice. So that kind of got me thinking where I was like, well, this is kind of perfect. I want something that I can process with a plugin host um, that is its own ecosystem. It's not Live Professor. It's not SoundGrid or whatever. Um, so I was like, okay, this could work. Um, so you basically just have an input and an output and you stick some plugins on it and it comes out the other end with the processing that you wanted it to do. All I'm doing is using it as a, as a physical, uh, digital insert on my groups. Um, or I'm using it as a, uh, as an aux send from the console aux to a digital output, which feeds an input to console, is processed for the effect, and then comes back as an output into the console. Uh, is everyone kind of with me? It's, a, it's, it's, it's a simple, it's a pretty simple input to output, output to input uh, path, but it's hilariously convoluted, and it took me weeks and months to actually figure out how this worked. Um, but it does. Um, um, so yeah, so. This basically mimics my groups and effects. Uh, let me just see. I haven't looked at the chat in a while. James Marsh, do you send your do you send your verbs effects to auxes off groups? No, all of my effect sends come off of the console's auxes, so it keeps me in that same workflow. It just, you know, whether I'm sending to something that's internal or I'm sending to something that's in console, it's the same. So I'm not having to think about it in any other way. Um, the, the idea is, is that I just basically use this as my virtual outboard rack. Um, so if you go back to my, my uh, uh, the offline editor, you'll see that um, anything that's a, a group as well, I add these little lowercase g's. So it's a g and then a kick in capitals. So I'm trying to create all these little visual indicators that like make sure I don't end up screwing myself somewhere down the line with sending the wrong thing to the wrong place or whatever. It just it's it's super helpful. It also means that it matches up with what I see here. Um, so it's basically zero in and zero out, <clears throat> and each path has a chain of plugs on it. Um, and they're all pretty standard kind of bits and pieces, but it looks like a lot of stuff. But if this was my like sound grid uh, inventory or rack or whatever, this would have like six things on it in each, each thing. Um, so I've been trying to actually go for a less is more approach and it's actually really working. Um, so, yeah, and it, it works super well. Um, so I've got my kick group, snare group, my toms group, my drum bus, bass group, 
due to the uh, incremental routing, I had to stick in a little mono here, uh, which is actually a, a gate verb on the, for the snare drum. Uh, guitar group, tracks group, and then I'm in pretty much into just uh, aux sort of send slash returns. Uh, chorus, nonlin reverb, vox verb, doubler, echo, and the AT, which is the autotune. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, there's nothing here that is kind of not, I mean, most of these kind of things are kind of studio influenced. Um, maybe with the exception of uh, the transient designer stuff here. Um, if I had the ability to have a four, like a four channel, one new transient designer, I would. But the fact is, is that these are actually super cool and they do exactly what I want them to do. Uh, Chris Stockton, are you sending anything back to Mons to feed back the band? No, I don't send anything back to, front, uh, to Mons. They just leave me, leave, leave me out there to do what I do. So, uh, yeah. Um, everything else is pretty standard fare. The only thing I would say that's kind of the only thing that's semi unique in this whole thing, and it's not even that unique, is this whole notion of parallel processing. Um, when I said earlier on about not sending anything to anything more than one uh, path, uh, in terms of all the in, all the insert sort of processes done on groups as opposed to channels, is to try and keep a relative base latency uh, the same. Um, so if I was to start to do parallel paths for parallel compression or whatever, I would start to get into some weird latency issues. Um, so one of the coolest things about everything that's in the UAD platform is, is that most of the kind of key stuff that I use compression wise has a wet dry. So I can do my parallel compression, but on the same group, um, and I'll go straight to my 2500 on my drum bus, uh, which is at a 50 50. Um, and it's great. I love it. Um, it's annoyingly a little bit noisy <laughs> as a plug in, but it's great. Um, and it means that I can actually get a 50 50 blend of wet dry on the same group without having to do to use lies two groups. Uh, I don't have enough groups to do that on my console. So this was a huge, huge deal. Um, same thing on snare. I, I don't, I've kind of run the gamut. I used to do like a 50 50 on the snare with the distressor, but now I just use full comp and it's great. Um, things like I run a virtual amp for my bass stem. Um, so I have a clean DI and a dirty DI, as I said earlier on, but I process that on the group with a virtual SVT, which ironically is what he has on stage. Uh, but I, I want to be able to dial things in, I guess, the way that I want to do it at front of house and to keep it pretty uh, true to what he would want as well, um, which works super well. Um, things like the vitalizer on guitars, which is awesome. Uh, it just helps create width and depth and also a nice kind of EQ curve within it as well. Um, and then, yeah, stuff like I have the 201, which is, if you remember, was kind of what I was using this. Um, <laughs> This is great because um, I have a macro set up on my console that sends a tap tempo MIDI command from my console into the computer, which then triggers the tap for this. So my tap tempo is still a thing um, because I don't run any snapshots uh, in this show. I keep everything live, uh, which is kind of where I was going to conclude, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so yeah, the echo, this is great. Sounds as good, if not better. So I, I now use this. Um, and the H, the, as I said, the AT is just as a, as an effects return, basically for a very specific reason. It's not actually used in the show. Um, and that's basically everything goes into that, gets processed and then everything comes out. 
uh, and returns on the inserts. And that's basically the gig. Um, and it's amazing the difference, the depth that a lot of these plugins and the, especially compression wise, like being able to have a load of distressors, you know, like that is amazing. Uh, the transient designers, as I said, are great. Um, I use voice of gods, um, on my kick and snare groups, um, which are awesome. They're really, really useful. Um, this kick group, uh, uh, voice of God, it, I change it depending on what kind of what the sub is like on a daily basis. But generally, nine times out of ten, it just works. It just creates this kind of resonant, nice, just bottom end bump. Um, the snare drum one, though, is literally that is like I would say nearly f more than half, sixty percent of my snare drum sound um, is that is that artificial harmonic in the low end that is created. Uh, by that plugin. Um, so, you know, that kind of concussive thing that you get from like VDOSC uh, that not a lot of PA systems have been able to replicate kind of since. Uh, that was kind of my thinking a long time ago. Whenever I was on Waves, I would use the R base or Max base to do the same thing, but the voice of God just does it in a much sweeter way. So, uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, uh, how is this? Where are the sends on Apollo console going to guitars? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, so, Gareth, good question. So, earlier on, I was saying about the, the input and output restriction. I basically use the sends in console as a way of cheating the input and output restriction. So, uh, basically, it goes one through eight. And then this is a stereo channel. Q bus one output is nine and 10, <laughs> uh, 11 and 12, et cetera, et cetera. So all I'm doing here is I'm actually utilizing the Q bus structure within console to give me a way of accessing more outputs. That's all it is. Um, when I had a smaller input count, going into console and I only have one unit, I actually used to use that to send things to multiple places without having to use auxes on the console. But now it's just inputs, outputs from the console uh, as normal. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, everything else is pretty much standard. Uh, I suppose, well, I will go back to Francois's question about the, uh, the foot switch. Um, I'm a real stickler for vocal spill. Uh, I really don't like it. Um, so I have a, a foot switch hooked up to the GPI inputs on my console. Um, the B button on it controls a macro that pushes my BV stem up by 6 dB. And then when I let go of it, it puts it back to zero. Because there are a couple of moments during the show where there's like really specific uh, vocal cues that come down that channel uh, that I want to accentuate. But the critical part of that on the other side is the A. The A triggers a ducker, as in a it's not it's not as not as not a ducker in the sense of a of a, pro, a processor. It's a physical fader ride from going from zero to negative ten. Um, so whenever Heather comes off of her mic, I just press the button and regardless of where I am on the console, her, her fader will come down to negative 10. Um, and that's kind of the sweet spot I found that if she was to say something like off the cuff and I missed it, like, a you know, let me hear you, whatever, uh, it would still be audible, but not like the vocal. Um, anything more, it's a bit obvious, but it's incredible the difference it makes. Because she'll, in a bridge part, she'll come off of her vocal position and she'll go wail at the drum kit or she'll run down into the pit or something like that. And it's just this open, low vocal mic was picking up everything because there's so much gain and so much processing on it. I was like, well, the fifth, the 545 helps, but it's the combination of everything and not relying on one thing to do all the reduction that I need. So 
one day I was like, what if I could just have a button that could just turn her vocal up and down a little bit? And that's what I did. And I know where all our cues are now because I've been working with them for so long and it's amazing the difference. It also punches out the uh, aux sends, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to her effects as well. So when I press that button, it turns the fader down by 10 dB. In fact, this is actually pretty easier if I just show you on the macro. <clears throat> um, it turns the vocal down by uh, it turns her input channel fader down by 10 dB. It turns her vocal send aux on the channel off, and then it turns the echo send off also. So even though I've turned my vocal channel vocal fader down by 10 dB, it's a it, everything is still post fade send to uh, her vo her uh, the vocal effect auxes. So it still wasn't dry enough. So what I did was I added the those next two elements into the macro. And it's literally like, there's a vocal, there's no vocal. There's a vocal, there's no vocal. And it clears the mix up so much that whenever the vocal does come in, it actually punches a little bit more because it's that kind of psychoacoustic thing where if you're listening to 16 bars of music and you've got all the spill going down that mic, your brain kind of gets used to that extra added high frequency mush that's mixed in with everything else. And then when the vocal comes in, it, it you know it's fine. But if you, do, I've just noticed that this actually creates a little pop in the vocal, which is super useful. Um, so that that's and I don't know any other console on the world in the world that would let me do that with this size. So that's again back to the flexibility thing. That's one of the reasons why I love the Digico platform. Um, sometimes I do both. So if I want less of her actual vocal for a part and more of the BV affected stem vocal. I do both fader, uh, both both button pushes on, on the foot switch. And that actually, again, it just happens to work that that plus six, negative 10 ratio works. So if you do it, you don't notice much of a perceptive dis, uh, difference between her real vocal and what's coming down that stem. And that's another reason why I process everything into a group. So I try to get the tonality of both the stem and her live vocal to be kind of the same so that you don't notice that it's a, you know, a, a distorted playback version of the vocal. It's, it, it's, it kind of, it, it, it makes sense. There's a, there's no cognitive dissonance. So, uh, so that's the foot switch thing. Uh, trust me, I would have more if I didn't only have two inputs on that console. Uh, uh, my, my, my friend, Josh Osmond, who mixes the Lumineers has a, yeah, he, uh, he's got a great setup, um, doing all sorts of uh, events on his, uh, SXL. Um, he was kind of the influence behind the idea. So thank you, Josh, for that great idea. Um, and yeah, I have, I have a bunch of macros. Uh, as I said, I don't, I don't, really, I don't really do any snapshots. Um, but I will do a lot of those kind of moves that I need to on macros. Uh, so I have my panic macro, as I said earlier on. Uh, I have a lot of spill sets for certain things, like shouts. Uh, my triggers are in a spill set. Uh, oh, there's a song called Red in the set, which has a side chain on the guitars and it's a proper like you know, like EDM kind of side chain. And we tried to like put on playback on the sub and it sucked um so we actually worked out a way that it was mainly on the guitar that we really wanted to get that and that and that so um that red macro all it does is it kicks in a sidechain compressor on the guitar group which is keyed from the live kick drum so even if she diverges a little bit in timing the side chain stays consistent with the kick drum so when you get the big kick drum you get the big dip and it comes back up again um the release time is millisecond perfect to the uh to the one 
uh, I guess, the one beat decay of the tempo of that one song, if that makes sense. So it's it it does what you would think it does in terms of its attack and release. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the red macro. Uh, I have a big snare, which is just, as I said, it's just a big, you know, hilarious cathedral thing. Um, Gaga is the macro that swaps between Heather's main dry vocal to the affected vocal um, and back. So it basically means that whenever I press the Gaga button, it just opens up the radio filtered vocal, mutes everything else of hers. And then when I undo that, it reverts back. So it means I can just pop it in and out for phrases and it's super quick. Um, and then you have like a system one. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, so I only I use four internal effects: the big snare, the echo is that ten tap delay, as I was saying. I use one of the internal pitches, um, and this chorus I don't actually use anymore. I was a being this between the dimension D in UAD, and it's just still in the rack, but I don't use it anymore. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I'll go back to that. Um, and I'm just trying to think of just to round this up in here. Is there anything I haven't really talked about? Let's see if there's anything in here. George Radford, how is the bass guitar split between clean and dirty on stage? Uh, it's two DI boxes, um, and the inputs to those are fed by a looper on his pedal board. So the loops follow the way that the loops are programmed will set out uh i'm actually just going to come out of this screen share for a second hey that's better hey my face um yeah it it it's programmed in the looper so that uh whenever he hits a certain effect loop or patch or whatever it will assign it to an output of the looper so it will always come down the same two di's in whatever order they need to so um cool i mean that's pretty much it uh i thought that would take 90 minutes it pretty much did uh sorry if i rambled a little bit i haven't talked to about gear in so long it's it's been incredibly cathartic um uh if anyone has any specific questions please feel free to ask. I realize people maybe need to dip out and go and eat dinner and do all that kind of normal stuff, but I'm going to hang on here for a little bit. Um, uh, if you want me to answer it on a text, text basis, if you want to write a question and I will answer it, feel free. Uh, or if you want to actually like dive in and actually say hello. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you for watching this first version of this kind of iteration. Um, um, again, not used. I never got into this kind of way of life to be seen or heard. Uh, but um, yeah. So uh, if anyone, if anyone doesn't already follow the, the Instagram group, go and go and check it out because that's kind of the way that I'm sharing anything, whether it's any of these Zoom hangouts. Uh, or any um, industry-specific kind of like uh, support or vendor, uh, manufacturer seminars, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of in the way I've been sharing it. Um, instead of doing it, you know, on a mailing list or anything, I'm just trying to, everyone's kind of cluttered at the minute. So I'm just trying to like, trying to make it easier for everyone. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, I have filmed this, as I said. Uh, I'll probably edit it a little bit so that it makes me look a bit less bumbling at times. Um, but uh, if everyone's cool with that, it'll just be my face in the screen caps. So um, uh, yeah, I will figure out a way of getting this online uh, for anyone that wants to watch it back. Um, as I said, if there's any questions um, that kind of come retrospectively, like, please reach out because I, I love talking about this stuff and I'd be more than happy to, to go through anything else. Um, I guess in a strange way, um, I should actually thank Digico uh, 
SSL, its day, and everyone I've worked with basically for like the last two years on this on this gig because it's kind of been a it started kind of like as a nucleus project for me to try and create a really like integrated, super flexible uh, front house rig that enabled me to do a lot of stuff um, that I've always kind of wanted to do, but never really had the courage to do. Um, I think that's something that not many people kind of admit to. You know, I, I, I never wanted to be a live sound engineer. I was terrified of mixing live. It was kind of like, I had, it was like, it's like having stage fright, but at the wrong end of the venue. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, it's been really amazing to like work with so many amazing people over the last like two years and develop my craft, be influenced by everyone else's craft. Um, and sort of share ideas because you know there's as i said right at the beginning i don't think there's a lot of rules with what we do um there's some fundamental stuff that's important to follow but i think for the most part you know we come up with creative solutions to do something that you think something needs you know um as i said i you know i'd be quite happy to mix this gig without all of that stuff um it, it's not a it's not a crutch um but it definitely makes make, mixing the same show for two years a little bit more dynamic and interesting purely from a uh, left brain, right brain perspective. I think it, you know, it's all about those little brush strokes. Um, so, and th there is a lot of philosophy to mixing, you know, um, for example, all of this stuff that I've just talked about for the last hour and whatever, it is kind of null and void if the PA system it's going into isn't right. Um, and isn't right can be a subjective thing, but it can also be a technical thing. So um, I know that uh, one of my friends um, has um, reached out about considering doing like a kind of like PA system design tuning 101 uh, for basically any experience level to just kind of like get that kind of thought process going about how much more important the system itself is as a reference point to what you're putting into it. Um, because uh, at the end of the day, if you're in a studio and you're mixing a record or you're a mastering engineer and you're mastering a record, if your room isn't right and your playback reference isn't right, you've no idea what you're doing. Um, and I've witnessed that big style um, over the last two and a bit years, specifically with this band, because it's the first time I've had a consistent configuration, workflow, and whatever. So you really notice from a day to day, if you remove those variables, um, what is working and what isn't working. So um, that's something that I'm going to hopefully try and organize pretty soon. Um, and I'll kind of, uh, it'll be in the same kind of format as this, except. I won't be hosting it. I'll be sitting here drinking coffee. I made a whole cup of coffee and I've drank like three sips of it. So I'm going to finish my cold coffee. Um, but yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, I hope this was useful. Um, I will hopefully do it again with somebody else that's more experienced and <laughs> is better at public speaking. Um, but uh, I'm going to stay... I'm just going to turn my video off for a sec, but I'm going to stay in the, in the chat for a little bit. And if anyone wants to like hang out and ask any questions, please feel free. I won't be offended if everyone leaves. Uh, but I will, um, as I said, I upload the kind of main portion of what I was talking about earlier on to a platform of, of some, some description. Um, so yeah, thanks very much guys. And yeah, please feel free to add anything into the chat here. If you want to, uh, follow up on anything more one-to-one, -one, um, I will be here. Cool. Thanks, guys.